tātou, uh, mō ngā uri uh, nā toki mō te whārua, uh, mā tātou hoki kei te mihinu nui ki a koutou, uh, mō ngā iwi whānui a te nōta. Um, so I'll just get straight, cut straight to the chase, because um, uh, unbeknown to you, there's a major event going to happen on Saturday and I've got to get down the street and get a few more <laughs> natives down here to vote for me. But just moving on to very quickly to the, um, the thinking behind Fine Order, because a number of our businesses there won't be part of this journey, Fine Order journey. Final Order is a comprehensive policy framework that reaches uh, across and has tentacles uh, ultimately through uh, the whole of government. And all businesses are tied into government. To pretend that the private sector is the major driver in business uh, in New Zealand is not true. Uh, when, when you're pumping $80 billion to $100 billion worth of investment uh, every year in annual budgets out into um, Aotearoa Whanui, uh, that, that is the biggest uh, driver of GDP. The biggest drivers of GDP are local government and uh, central government. Uh, I'll give you an example. The three DHPs in Auckland, uh, Waitimata, um, uh, Auckland, or Tamaki Makaura, and um, counties Manukau, uh, is bigger business as Frontera on uh, employees uh, and on um, economic uh, stimulation and drive. So, so you've got to place this in context. Now, here's the real context to our business people. Uh, it is extraordinarily important that what was just said in the introductory comments, that uh, we, we get more resourcing into our hands to stimulate our own people and our own economy. One of the quickest ways we can do that uh, is not attack the mean-spirited, tight-fisted way in which treaty settlements um, are delivered. Because as you all know, one year of the correction service, not the police, not the, not the courts, not justice, just one year of the criminal justice system and locking us up in terms of corrections costs more than all of the treaty settlements paid out in the last 26 years, or all, all. So there is huge dollar values going in from Kaitaia to, to Kaikoi to Whangarei, uh, all the way down here, where uh, you will see multiple non-Māori funded of managing the so-called Māori failure. So the key to um, our job at a macroeconomic level is to get uh, significant uh, transfers across to us. For example, budget um, 2020, largest budget in the history of uh, New Zealand uh, financial accounting records, uh, $100 billion. 0.3% uh, went to Māori by Māori for Māori. 99.7%, if it trickles down to us, went to Pākehā, by Pākehā, for Māori. We have to change that whole narrative. We have to change that. Uh, because uh, they, uh, just to give you an example, in health. Um, in health, see, in health is a huge uh, industry, education, uh, wealth. They're huge, uh, these are huge industries. And within those industries, they all have to eat. They all have to drive to work. They all have to fill up somewhere. They all have to have uh, repair jobs. They all have to live in a house that has to be built by us. So don't for one minute think that in concentrating on health, welfare, education and justice budgets across the whole of government uh, uh, is where it's at. Because if you lower our sights down to that, we are fighting over crumbs. It's called trickle down economics. And um, Māori's never even see a drop. I'll give you an example. Uh, Ministry of Health, for every dollar voted to Māori out of the budget, uh, a dollar goes to the Ministry of Health to be devolved. 25 cents of your dollar and my dollar is deducted there. Goes to your DHB, the DHB deducts another 65%. It then goes to your PHOs and GPs. By the time a Māori walks into a clinic, he has to pay. Now somebody put their hand in my pocket and spent all my money before I got to the clinic. And I don't have a say over the quality of the service. And that really? So we've become numbed into believing that um, the way in which um, macroeconomic state transfers cross over, you know, to, to uh, all of the health workers. Another abomination, Oranga Tamariki, $700 million of its budget per annum, per annum goes to the management of the Māori problem. It never goes to fix it. It never goes to fix it. When we do an uplift, if we did an uplift, we wouldn't arrive with the cops. 
We wouldn't cut an umbilical cord and we wouldn't rip a baby out of mother's arms. We would have their whānau there. So there is a major change required in the way in which we, we are treated, but we have numbed ourselves down by not fighting more like our, our ancestors did and, and standing up and being more assertive. You know, the fact that we, are, we, we are contract cancer 10 years ahead of everybody else, but are not allowed to be screened 10 years ahead of everybody else, that's state-sponsored knowing manslaughter because hundreds of Māori will, will suffer a gory death that they, that, they could have, that they could have had identified earlier and they could have had longevity and they could have uh, healed. But by the time we get our screens, they know it's too late. Um, and I'm sick of this palliative care stuff. Why, why, why are we starting to become specialized at euthanizing our own people? You know, you've got to go back to the causation of this. So when you look at these numbers and that, we have to awaken uh, to the, the uh, mystery and the discrimination. We have to call it out. We have to, we have to grow up and start to believe, and we know. Now, in final order, um, we set up a distribution mechanism within 10 days that uh, was more efficient than what Progressive, that runs countdowns, or foodstuffs that runs pack and saves could do up in this country. 10 days. When all our regulators and all the people standing over us left, and our people stood up to protect themselves, uh, through, through the first lockdown, it was one of the marvellous, ex most marvellous exhibitions of uh, Māori kotahitanga uh, in the north that I've ever seen in my life, outside the raising of a company. So outside the Māori war effort in the Second World War, we saw um, an outstanding contribution from uh, every rohe. Uh, and uh, we learn to honour uh, and respect one another rather than being divided and ruled over crumbs and fighting one another over what the white man puts on the table. You know, we want a fair cut of the cake. So, so it, uh, COVID taught us a number of things. And COVID taught us uh, um, that we have to start to do business with one another and filter money into one another. And so uh, one of the policies uh, the party I stand for, Māori Party, has got is that 25% of all Crown contracts come to Māori. Now, why is that? I'll tell you why. The Aboriginals, our brothers and sisters across in Australia get it. Afro-Americans get it. Hispanics get it. The only Indigenous people in the world that can't get an affirmative procurement program out of the state are us Māori. And we tolerate that? And we accept that? You know what that means? We have to go knocking on the Pākehā's door for money and for work. If we got the transfer that we rightly deserve across to us, they'd be coming knocking on your door saying, how do I employ your boys so I can get a part of that action? And we, have to, we have to turn this thing on its head because it's just unjust and unfair. And so I wanted to talk about a macroeconomic <clears throat> um, view of ourselves, uh, understanding our true value. And, I, and I'll just conclude to the business people that are there if it would be remarkable, you do your numbers on um, us getting a fair share of the annual transfers, of the annual transfers, you know? Uh, why is it that we've numbed and dumbed ourselves down into believing that second class citizenship is the only entitlement that we have in regard to a treaty that was signed in Waitangi? We, we, we really have to awaken ourselves to, to a just slice of the cake rather than fighting among one another over the crumbs. So um, uh, I, I wanted to just conclude very quickly by uh, acknowledging the North. Um, the foundation uh, karawas and kaumatas of Nahawe Fa and Puki Koe, uh, of Papakura, of Manurewa, of Whariwatia, of Wani Waititi, they're all from the North. So the beacons and uh, bastions of hope um, that was set up down here after your uncles and grandparents came down here on the, um, on the Ruru train uh, and went home. A remarkable, a remarkable presence, um, a remarkable history, right? And um, uh, in Honiwaititi, Uncle Jerry Graham was our first karaua before it was built, okay? And then, <clears throat> well, Uncle Haki Wihongi, um, I've never seen a more unbridled uh, man in my life. Um, he just is, he was just in your face, Napoli. And um, I'm talking about what he used to do to the white folks down here. 
So I'll give you one example. Like um, the mayor got elected, uh, Acid Corbyn, and he took the treaty off the wall, so no, all hell broke loose. Cut a long story short, we arranged to smoke the peace pipe down at Hawaii Waititi Marae. Acid Corbyn comes in for the first time, a council met on our marae. And when Acid Corbyn sat down, Uncle Jack got up and he said, hey, Acid, you know when you walk through that waharoa, I'm the mayor here, you're nothing. And I, we were sitting there amazed that uh, Māori would stand up and say that because we'd become a coward, you know, not C-O-W-A-R-D, we'd become meek and, 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 and had bowed our heads. And with leadership like Uncle Jack Wee homies, uh, that's why we're on fire, on fire down here. So don't, don't ever lose that unbridled Ngāpui, listen, you fellas, um, it's outstanding. Uh, us, na us Ngāti pros just snuck into all those meeting houses you built and did all the nice whakairo. <laughs> that's how we injected ourselves into it. But uh, Fana Water is um, a, a liberation program. It's a liberation program. It's an awakening program. And it covers the whole of government. And it can be anything you want it to be. And the beauty about it, Fana Water, is it's how you design it for your hood. I don't make no decisions. No one in Wellington can determine what works for me over here in Henderson. Just as no one in Wellington can. And your regional offices that feast off our failure, you want to close them down and they should be transferred across to all our operations up and down the north. It's as simple as that. And then, then you'd see, you'd have parkers knocking on your door looking for jobs, right? Not the other way around. Okay, so I just thought I'd, um, I'd just end my rant there <laughs> and um, say to uh, our Akahuarangis, you know, an, a Nader, Glavish, formidable, you know, a Meripeka, Rokawa Tate, um, Lady Moxon, Auntie Edita Fifirangi. All, all of our areta kōpū, all of our uh, women who champion uh, our cause and uh, had a go at Oranga Tamariki, had a go at Fana Ora. Um, you know, it takes courage to stand up, and it takes courage to continue. And we can all say, "Oh no, don't bite the hand that feeds us. They'll cut my contract." You colonised Maori, don't say that. <laughs> what you got to say? What you got to say is, "Oh no, no, I'm, I'm ripping your arm off because you're feeding me malnutrition diet." That's what you got to say. So anyway, uh, final order is going to be, um, regardless of what happens on Saturday, uh, a, a, a massive uh, a program of just liberating our, our hearts, minds, and souls. And they can steal our water, and they can steal the land, and they can steal the foreshore and seabed. But one thing, if they, if they, one thing that if they confiscate one thing, never let it be your heart, mind, soul, and spirit. Because without that, we, we're gone. So I just wanted to conclude there um, and say thanks very much for uh, beaming um, me in. And um, Calvin, Calvin, he's already in Parliament. So vote your sister there, Maria Mena Kappa Kinga. Kingy, vote her in. Do you, do you don't want to leave her out of the house there? She's homeless, will be homeless. <laughs> so how do I kill Koto? I've got to keep going out there now so hunt a few more Maori votes out in Auckland. Kapai? Kapoi, ah, I'm here on the Kiaku Matsu JT Homeyano to Piki Paki Paki Kiaya. Got it.